Okay. So we're recording. Uh, Dean, take it away. Thank you, Jonathan, and uh, thank everybody for uh, for joining us here uh, here today. Uh, today we're going to talk about uh, the recent Canadian trench pricing jurisprudence, and uh, specifically we're going to talk about uh, three most recent cases: uh, Teletech Canada, Softmock Inc., and uh, McKesson Canada. Uh, we're going to spend uh, most of our time on McKesson Canada. McKesson has a lot of um, a lot more information, a lot more precedent. Uh, with that case uh, compared to uh, to a Teletech Canada and uh, and Softmock, uh, one unfortunate characteristic that that these three share is that uh, the taxpayer has uh, has lost essentially in, in each of these three cases, uh, which which isn't typical in Canada. You know the cases before that, uh, the taxpayer has has done much uh, better compared to these these three recent cases, and our objective today is is kind of to talk through it to to give a better uh, try to kind of understand what went wrong, and if if you are in in a similar situation or a similar fact patterns, uh, what can you learn from this to to avoid their uh, you know similar fate that uh, that these companies have uh, have been in. Um, so maybe we just move on to a Teletech Canada. We'll just start with with that one under the slide three, and. Uh, it's kind of interesting. Teletech Canada, as well as McKesson, both of these uh, companies are familiar to trans price practitioners for a, a different reason. Uh, once in in trans price, when we're doing our profit level indicator benchmarking, if we're benchmarking a certain activity, uh, Teletech and uh, McKesson often show up in in these benchmarks, and and they have been kind of referred to in, in the community as as your usual suspects. If you're for Teletech Canada, if you're benchmarking a a, a, a company that does uh, more of your, your telecommunication, uh, your telephone type of, of services or something similar to that, it often shows up as well as McKesson if you're doing your your, your uh, distribution of, of medical products or, or kind of some, some routine pharmaceutical or medical disposables, uh, they typically show up. So it's, it's kind of interesting seeing these companies dealing with their own transpressing issues instead of on the other side when we're kind of dealing with them on the on a benchmarking basis. Um, on Teletech Canada, the issue here, uh, Teletech Canada, it's, it's a wholly owned subsidiary of, of Teletech Holdings Inc. or Teletech US. Uh, back in the year 2000, they did a, a significant restructuring and the restructuring really treated uh, Canada as much more of a routine uh, operating uh, subsidiary where a lot of their scope and responsibility was was restructured away, and, and they essentially followed instructions of their um, of the U.S. company, the, their 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 parent, in providing their um, in providing their their services to the Canadian market. Uh, in the restructuring, the Teletech U.S. provides a lot of the administrative and support that Teletech Canada needs to to operate. So uh, this is a significant restructuring they did in, in the year 2000. In the in the case here, after the fact, they they discovered that they have been making a, a, um, accounting errors in the implementation of the transfer pricing policy, and what they what happened was that they actually uh, overreported income in Canada and underreported income in the U.S. and they weren't following the transfer pricing policy that they established at the time that they restructured it. Um, next slide, there, Jonathan. Uh, so what what happened here is that uh, it wasn't until 2006 where the U.S. amended the U.S. tax returns uh, post this restructuring and and contacted the uh, both the U.S. and Canada Competent Authority for relief of this this double tax uh, when they amended the the tax return and under the the Canada U.S. Treaty for the year 2000 ending December 31st. Uh, in 2000, their deadline is, is really the end of 2006 in order to uh, notify the competent authority to keep that year open uh, when, the, when they're requesting the, the, the double tax, uh, relief from double tax. What happened is that they was, it was denied in November 2006 and the basis of the denial is that it wasn't initiated by the CRA or the IRS uh, that causes double taxation. Uh, ironically, in, in December 2006, the IRS then sent the CRA a letter uh, that the IRS had reassessed the amended tax return. So in addition to the correction, the IRS went in and, and audited it and, and was assessed the, uh, the amount there 
they invited the, they contacted the CRA to participate in the competent authority process, uh, but the CRA did not respond or notify uh, to Teletech Canada that it received uh, this invitation. So it's I say it's ironic because if if they did not request the, um, the relief back in May of 2006, their basis of denial that it wasn't caused by the CRARS is is moot it, later on in December 2006 when they did request the uh, the relief from from double tax. Moving on in July 2008, the IRS adjusted um, the returns further. So again, they increased another 11.2 million. Uh, which is on top of, this, of the already 38.3 million from the 2000 through 2002 amended tax returns. Uh, so it's a, a you know, significant amount of double tax that uh, that is present with Teletech Canada um, and Teletech US. So essentially, what we have here is that there there are strict uh, procedure requirements to, uh, to to be aware of when requesting the competent authority. Uh, strict timelines that we have to be aware of. And also communication is key is it, uh, on really contacting the competent authorities to make sure that if they were notified um, where the process is, such that you know the instance back in December 2006 might have had more communication uh, that the CRA just just sat on. Um, in addition, the November of, of this year, the the IRS released a, a draft procedures for competent authority in conjunction with their draft procedures for the APA process. And one of the, the aspects of that draft uh, uh, competent authority procedures is the IRS has now uh, put in there that they, they do accept taxpayer-initiated uh, submissions uh, such as this if there was an error. So they kind of recognize that, that it, it is okay. So when they denied it in the past, uh, this has now been covered in with the, on the IRS side at least, uh, as long as it doesn't uh, look or, 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 or kind of uh, envision or kind of appears that it's after the ta after the fact tax planning that they will look at this seriously and accept this comp authority uh, submission. Uh, now, uh, I'm going to hand it over to Jonathan and just kind of talk through about uh, the procedure that Teletech Canada kind of did trying to get this competent authority negotiation started when it when it has been denied in the past through a couple applications through the uh, the court process the the mandamus and I'll hand it over to you, Jonathan to go through yeah. the next couple slides yeah so what happened was in in May 2011 and you realize that this is well after the fact Teltec Canada went to the federal court and asked for an order of mandamus which is effectively um, what you do if you if you see that the government is um, acting illegally or refusing to act. And there's been some recent success with mandamus cases against the Canada Revenue Agency. There was a recent case in which, um, you know, the, the, the taxpayer won because the CRA had refused to process a tax return because there was a claim on there for a, a uh, for a tax uh, shelter and the CRA was just basically in a sense sort of very passive aggressively harassing the taxpayer by refusing to neither accept it reject it or do anything they were just holding it and hanging it up there and so the, the so uh, an order for mandamus is basically an order uh, request saying you have to do something now it, it an order for mandamus won't give the court the power to tell the the government authority what to do it just tells it just Either a stop what you're doing, which might 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 well be nothing, or in fact, um, you should, uh, you know, or just do something, or do what you're legally required to do. And so, it, it in some ways, it made some sense because what they were trying to do was they were saying, well, you're refusing, you're making an ongoing refusal, you're uh, to engage in the uh, in the um, in the um, common authority process, because there's a there's a dual uh, double tax situation, and you're you continue to refuse to do it. Now, um, and so their situation, you know, it wasn't completely hopeless. It was a, it was a, a good shot, but technically, um, the order for mandamus was denied in May of 2013. So this has been a while that this has been denied. But the crown basically won on what can only be described as technical grounds. Because what the federal court found was that each of the two denial letters, both in uh, the one in 2006 and the later one after they they were they requested 2008, um, both of them 
they saw them as discrete decisions okay and so there was no continuing course of conduct it was a discrete decision and if you they make a a a um a discrete decision you can go to the federal court of appeal and object it on judicial review grounds saying you know this wasn't done properly they didn't follow their own procedures there was you know uh, a reject you know they didn't follow natural justice or they didn't give you know the taxpayer or the individual sort of basic procedural fairness um you can make those kind of complaints, but you have to do them within a strict 30 day time limit for what's called a uh, sitter um, If I'm saying it right, everybody has their own way of saying it. It's, but, uh, but to make that request, you have to make it within 30 days. And they didn't. And they tried to sort of bootstrap themselves up by saying this was an ongoing denial. Um, the tax court or the, the federal court of appeal didn't see it that way. I can understand basically the fundamental problem with this case and i can see why it was litigated by um, it was litigated by sal baracci out, out of baker and mckenzie and i used to work for him so i, I kind of have an idea as to what he was thinking um or i'm just guessing but basically the the issue here was this whole sort of sort of injustice that was done to teltech was they said in 2006 we you know you know we are rejecting this request for competent authority because there's been no change in the situation nothing's happened the u.s hasn't done anything we haven't done anything what are you asking us to do like there's nothing here and in that they actually said but if there's some information we might reconsider okay or you know might reconsider might do something um and and a month less than a month later they actually get notification from the americans the americans that the u.s is changing it well one would think that they would do something about that because they promised that and so because they had made this sort of commitment to reconsider and then they didn't reconsider and then in the later decision they kind of rejected it even though they had this previous sort of commitment to reconsider um it didn't doesn't make a lot of sense in terms of fairness so so it, it the play here was just to hope that the judge would get ticked off enough at the cra for having basically you know uh, not done what they promised they would do and, and, and follow up on this. Uh, but the judge didn't bite and he didn't go. And I think the main reason he didn't go was because I think when you read through it, the judge sort of felt that that Teltech kind of Canada kind of sat on its rights, wasn't very active. You know, Teltech Canada only found out that this, uh, that the Americans had sent this uh, December 2006 notice on discoveries. Once they actually requested discovery documents, this is the first time they quote heard about it. But here's the thing. You know, Teltec US, the parent who is, you know, and Teltec Canada is basically only an opco with no sort of decision making capacity, that Teltec US would have known that this would have come. Like it, this would have been information because they would have been adjusted, right? So the fact that this was going on is something that Teltec Canada probably could have found out about. And, you know, maybe not, maybe the, the U.S. wasn't as communicative about when exactly they put this notice in. But the, I think that was sort of more the feeling of, from the case was that the judge just felt, well, you know, the CRA kind of did you wrong. But, but if you'd been on your toes, uh, you could have done a lot better out of this. So I think the takeaways from this one are quite clear, is that if you're going into a common authority situation and you get a rejection of any kind from the CRA on anything, file uh file for judicial review file for sidereary and file it like the next day i would rather put you know once you put that request in i would ask counsel personally i would say we should get our request for judicial review ready to go and get all the format ready get it all ready locked and loaded and um you know because you can do most of the most of the dot most of the 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 the, the request you know, before the fact, put all the facts in, et cetera, et cetera, and then just fill in the date that they rejected it and file your judicial review the next day so that you don't, um, so you don't get into this situation. Now that might seem to be a little bit premature, but, uh, and, and sort of abusive in the sense of just automatically going to judicial review on everything the CRA says with competent authority, but with the way the deadlines work and the way that they seem to be kind of asleep at the wheel on stuff, um, the first thing is that once you have that judicial review, comp uh, uh, requested now they're in a discovery process so if something like this did happen you would at least find out about it um, because they would have to give you the documents uh, that they had related to this and also um, you're not going to be left sort of like these guys stuck with with no um, no capacity whatsoever to to get relief one of the things that you have to sort of 
and yet another issue that I so I would say one file your judicial reviews just immediately just just do it um, and and don't and don't bother waiting you know get ready for it and then do it the day they reject you on anything and everything um, the the next issue I would say is that what's interesting is the US IRS has said that you know after the ta after the fact tax planning one of the things you have to understand that's sort of bizarre about this is even by 2006 back then Canadian corporate tax rates even for non CCPCs like Teltec are actually lower than American entities. So unless Teltec US, this is what's bizarre about this whole thing, is it, and, and kind of upsetting, is that Teltec US probably wound up paying more tax on the double tax, you know, you know, like they reallocated funds or profits to the US on which they would have paid, quote, more tax than if they'd kept those taxes in Canada. So Teltec was actually, you know, they might have had some losses in the US or there might have been moving some money around. If that was the case, well, then I could see why the court said, well, this is after the fact tax planning, and so it's not really right. But I don't think that was the case. The worst part about this case was that Teltec was kind of doing the right thing, even though it was going to cost them more money, and it wound up costing them even more money because they didn't get their 25 or 26 cents on the dollar back from, from the CRA. So this is just a complete and utter disaster uh, for Teltec and, and, and really sort of a cautionary tale about trying to go into this kind of uh, about what you how you have to really guard yourself if you're going into this and you have to really um, although the competent authority is supposed to be this kind of cooperative thing from the taxpayers perspective you, you really have to play with your elbows up and you know file file your documents immediately file for judicial review the second they reject you and just keep at them on a constant basis because they're just not um, gonna help you and that's part of the basis so moving right along uh, spent more time on this than I should have. Um, uh, I should have put this slide up while I was talking. Anyway, um, now we're going to move on to soft mock, and I'm going to give it back to Dean to talk a little bit about this before uh, uh, I make some comments. There you go, Dean. Okay, thanks, Jonathan. Uh, soft mock, this case here, it, it's uh, not dealing with a, a transfer pricing a, a assessment or reassessment. It's, it's dealing with the uh, the foreign-based information requests, uh, and it's kind of an interesting case. It kind of confirms or kind of gives more detail on on what um, what happens during a foreign-based information request, and, and kind of what are the uh, the options or the limited options that we're seeing available to the Canadian taxpayer. Uh, a bit of background: Softmock, a Canadian footwear retailer, uh, has related uh, Bahamian companies that provide various services to Softmock uh, merchandising and information technology, business development, and uh, software licensing. Uh, the CRA, they're auditing the 2005-2006 tax years, and they issued a formal foreign-based information request uh, to obtain more information with respect to these uh, Bahamian companies and the transactions, uh, which they characterize as the fees of being substantial amounts uh, during under the audit. Uh, on the next slide there, the, the CRA review of the payments uh, basically concerning whether the services were provided in the Bahamas uh, or are these services that are being provided just in, in Canada, how are these services uh, provided, and what, what's the basis of, of the of the service fees, what's the transfer pricing methodology, and is it the price arm's length. Uh, when the information request was, was sent, uh, some of the information was provided uh, but some was held back, uh, saying that the information was confidential, proprietary, uh, releasing information would harm the company's competitive advantage, and, and this may go back to the uh, you know, the information technology or the software, proprietary software that the company uh, could be using. Uh, during the, the, the course, uh, what they found is that Softmock really failed to show um, that the requested info, in, info um, would inadvertently capture the Bahamian company's irrelevant business dealings, so it's not necessary that you're get, you know, they're gathering too much information, information that's that's not relevant. Uh, failed to show that the providing information would endanger the business relationship, that the information was confidential or sensitive, um, and um, so essentially, they, they they during the um, the request to to uh, you know to appeal this information request that. Uh, Really was it was not found in the favor of, of Softmock, really due to the wide ranging powers that the CRA has to collect the information and the kind of the low threshold uh, that uh, they have to provide to really show that requested information is relevant and, and reasonable. 
uh, and further on, um, you know, just more recently, uh, the appeal to the Federal Court of Appeal on, on uh, just last month, January 21st, was then uh, dismissed. Yeah. Um, just to to put some comments on this, so Softmock is 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 one of a long series of cases, starting with eBay, Fidelity, and some previous cases below that, Sapien, where the taxpayer has consistently consistently lost. Um, I was I was at I was at Baker McKenzie when we lost both eBay and um, a, a, and Fidelity. Uh, both of those cases were were you know eBay less so, but Fidelity um, it was really problematic. And and I you know one of the things you have to sort of take away from this is that um, the CRA loves two thirty one point six. They will use it like a sledgehammer. Um, they will use it in ways that I think are completely inappropriate and, and, and excessive. Um, in the earlier cases, uh, there are some cases in which um, they sort of crafted their requests and then the taxpayer came around and said, oh, well, your requests are confusing. Uh, you know, we don't quite understand, blah, blah, blah. And so the CRA's response to that, rather than actually sort of think about what it is they want and ask for specific things, they stopped doing that completely. They stopped talking at all about what it is that they wanted and they just basically started drafting these requests for everything give us everything and that's and and that's pretty clear so they don't have to worry about being unclear but it's also excessive 231.6 unlike the domestic provisions has this capacity in there where where the court is supposed to review and see whether or not this is reasonable or excessive but the court has consistently not actually done anything on that you know going back to fidelity and I don't want to fight old lost cases but the case in fidelity was particularly egregious simply because they asked for the entire financial documentation about the entire multi-billion dollar fidelity empire when the Canadian entity was less than half of one percent of the business and you know the taxpayer was very seriously concerned about you know giving up all this information but what was more sort of disconcerting about this was that had the CRA, and this was sort of the argument, was the CRA could have turned and gone to the U.S. government and requested this same information, all of the information that it was requesting from the U.S. government. The problem is we knew for a fact, having talked to the IRS, that the IRS's response would have been that they would have told the CRA to go get stuffed because this would have been an excessive and an egregious overreaching simply because they didn't need all of that information to be able to assess the Canadian entity. Um, the, the analogy that I put on that case, and which is somewhat like this, it, it, which applicable in this case as well, is, you know, um, you know, you know, Canada was like a baby toe on the entire body, but the CRA insisted the only way that they could diagnose whatever issues there might be would be to get the full body MRI, you know, full body MRI or nothing. And it's like, well, how about you take a picture of the toe and maybe the other toes, maybe a foot, and then maybe you come back and talk to us. And if you see something that has to do with something else, maybe then you make that request. Maybe this should be done in succession as to after you sort of looked at what we gave you um, and what what's relevant, you know, even, you know, like other countries, like maybe look at Canada and Australia and New Zealand or South Africa or, or some other country where it has a similar level of operations and see if it's comparable. How would we do that first? Nope. We have to have everything. And knowing full well that if they don't get everything which they request, well, then the taxpayer is in this horrible position where they can't use anything that comes out of uh, any foreign information to be able to defend themselves. So you're really up against the wall. The CRA is making excessive demands that even that they know for a fact they couldn't get from foreign governments, even if they requested under the you know expanded uh, modern. Um, you know, rules under the under the treaty for for cooperation. You know, some of their requests are excessive. What I really found with the soft mock, the one thing you know, I, I you know, soft mock was a loser from the get go. They were never going to win this based on case law. But the but the one thing that that sort of shows you how bad this has gotten is that on cross examination, the CRA officer said, "Well, I need all this information in order to do my job, and without it, I can't do it." And then he also admitted that he actually hadn't read at all any of the documentation that the taxpayer had already provided. Nothing, nothing, I hadn't even looked at it. So, you know, how does he know that he needs all this other stuff if he hasn't even looked at what he's gotten? Like, and, 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 and for me, that seems to be just, you know, that's ridiculous. How about, and this is part of the process is that this, this 231.6, I don't want to get too 
editorial about this, although you can understand where exactly how I feel about this. You get a couple of beers in me and I'll tell you <laughs> to be more blunt about what I think. Uh, but in this particular case, I think that, um, you know, you've got a, this thing is being abused by the CRA and uh, it would be better if they didn't. But the takeaway from this case is very simple. If you are involved in a transfer pricing audit, you can expect to cough up everything. And if you don't cough up, cough up everything, they'll hit you over the head with 231.6, and then you'll have to. Now, I can see that there are issues why one might not, you know, one might kind of slow roll them and not give them everything they want up front. Um, the fundamental issue is that in transfer pricing cases, one of the key things you often have to show might not be relevant in this one is that, you know, one of the things you have to understand is that in, is that in transfer pricing cases, um, you know, there's more than one government involved and so there's more than some one thing going on like you, you go back to and this is just generic information um you know uh that you go to glaxo which was the big which was a big case in glaxo what you saw was uh, the taxpayer won that case but it, they won but what people don't understand the reason why they won was not because of the tax court can decision they won because they were able to drag that thing out long enough that the other country in which income might have been attributable to was the uk and they have a drop dead date that they won't reassess past that date regardless and they were able to just sort of drag out black so long enough that it didn't really matter what canada did because there wasn't going to be this corresponding income inclusion in the uk so for them total win simply because they dragged it out. So I can see why Softmark might have gone into this case and fought it simply to, you know, run the clock a bit. And and that's within your rights as a taxpayer. There's no reason why you should cough everything up, you know, from the get-go. Um, so, you know, I can see, you know, why you might want to do this and, and force them to force you uh, and take your own sweet time about it. But generally speaking, uh, when it comes to 31.6, you're going to lose. So, you know, be prepared. Anyway, that, that's, that's what I have to say about that. Um, so I'm going to unmute, I'm going to mute myself and put Dean back on, and then we're going to get into the, uh, McKesson. Okay. Thanks, uh, Jonathan. Uh, so McKesson, uh, this one is, is a, a quite interesting case. It talks about, um, uh, the factoring transaction and let me just kind of run through the transactions and, and give you a bit of background because it can get a, a bit uh, complicated. Uh, it's one of the most, uh, I don't know if it's the longest uh, transfer pricing uh, judgments out there, but it's over 100 pages uh, that the, the Justice Boyle released and in it he, he talks about uh, several aspects of transfer pricing. Uh, it refers back to the, the, the Glaxo's Miss Klein on certain issues on looking at the series of transactions, talks about uh, you know tax purpose, uh, even addresses on uh, some kind of unfortunate footnote where he addresses the uh, penalty threshold, uh, puts a comment on that. Uh, well, as you know, what point in the range do you do you go with, and how do you deal with expert witness testimony? Uh, so there's a whole lot of, of of different things addressed all around this this factoring re receivables. Uh, so it's quite a, quite quite an interesting uh, case and interesting read, uh, long one, but definitely an interesting read uh, on the. Uh, on McKesson. So what we have here is, is back in 2003, and, and, and this case is actually only for a short year, it's only for three and a half months, um, and, and in, in March of uh, 2003 of this, this short year, uh, McKesson Canada entered into a, a factoring uh, agreement, uh, the RSA there that stands for Receivable Sales Agreement, where they sell to uh, a Luxembourg related party, their, their accounts receivables, and then they enter into a service arrangement, that's the SA there, the services arrangement, where McKesson Canada still continues to, to collect, maintain, uh, and, and deal with the, the accounts receivables and has that administration in that, that function, which then they're reimbursed uh, by MIH, um, the Luxembourg-related party, for um, servicing the receivables that they're selling to MIH. Uh, back in March 2003, they sold the receivables, and, and the RSA is, is a five-year term. Um, so even though the court case only covers a short time period of time, uh, this agreement then continued for five years, where they would sell the receivables at approximately 2.2% discount uh, to MIH. MIH is uh, essentially that's what they do. Uh, 
um, at the time it was the transactions entered into there's they had one employee uh, so MIH they get the got an indemnity from another Luxembourg company uh, when MIH paid McKesson Canada during that sale the initial sale of the accounts receivable they received a loan from uh, their indirect Ireland parent uh, which then received a guarantee from MIH too uh, so in looking at all these these different transactions that were they were examined looked into the CRA reassessed the the discount rate uh, through the RSA uh, from the 2.2 percent to approximately half uh, just over one percent is what they, they reassessed it to um, so just to give a bit more of a, a background on on McKesson what they do they're, uh it's it's a their business they're a distributor of um, uh, you know, pharmaceutical. Their main customers are, are, you know, hospitals, nursing homes, pharmaceuticals, and the nature of their business is that it's it's very high revenues. Uh, one of the largest companies uh, in in North America for for revenues in Canada, 2002 had about three billion in revenues, but the profitability of this company is is fairly low. It's it's about it's in the case that says it's around the two percent area for the operating margin. Um, distant by the nature of the business. Uh, so when you have a, an extra additional charge that you didn't have before, as far as the discount, you do receive the, the benefit of giving your the financial uh, money up front. Uh, but when it's 2.206% is the factoring, what ended up happening is in, in the years that the profitability is essentially wiped out. And, and since this period of time, the profit has been very flat for McKesson Canada. Uh, so one sense, if you take a step back and you're looking at, you know, how did they get um, picked for, for audit or, or, you know, this type of transaction, because it was just the nature of it, the magnitude of it kind of took that small profit of that, they, that Canada had and they essentially put it down to zero. It's definitely a very large red flag for the CRA to, to look at in the question further uh, to go through the audit. Um, the... Uh, through the through the audit, the, the CRA um, again re looked at the, the all the different transactions, the, the servicing fee that they received. Uh, by doing that, they had much stronger support. Uh, but going through that that discount, uh, they then recessed it at uh, to about half at 1.013 percent. I have to unmute myself. There we go. Okay, and um, Jonathan, if you wanted to, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. We'll, we'll bounce back on this one because it's it's fairly complicated. The biggest issue with McKesson is like it's a hundred pages. So what you could probably go on for about three hours just going into the details of this thing because it was incredibly complicated. There was an awful lot going on just in terms of how they got to their two point zero six percent. There was an awful lot going on as to how the the, CR, the CRA arrived at one point. Uh, zero one three or whatever it was um a lot of detail so the the, the danger with this one is to you know you get lost in the weeds um and so we want to sort of look at this in the big picture and also do it one of the things is you have to sort of look at what they did and how they did it was um okay so this was um you know blake's had the file and blake's litigated the file but when they set this up originally um they had some transfer pricing advice. Uh, they were advised that this would be a good transaction to do, but then they didn't go out and get a proper transfer pricing report, in my humble opinion. What Blake's did was they turned around, they went to the securitization department of TD Bank, and TD Bank had had relationships with McKesson. They'd done a previous very small little factoring tax-driven structure that they'd done in previous years, so there was a right relationship there. And they just asked them to sort of price it out. Um, what would be the price of this in the market? Well, here's the thing, the securitization department of, of TD Bank, it, they do securitize collateralized transactions, um, which aren't exactly what this was. Now, they had a history of doing a factoring transaction with them, but the way that they sort of went about this wasn't the way that you would go about doing, doing a factoring transaction. And really, that's not kind of what they do. So the uh, from the very get-go, it seemed like a little bit of a mismatch. Um, second of all, when they made this 2.2%, they seem to make a lot of pro-taxpayer assumptions um, that um, 
were either utterly unjustified or they couldn't they had some reason but they never explained it so for example many of the entities that they were dealing with um are very major you know institutions hospitals in canada hospitals in canada generally pay their bills okay so their failure to pay rate like their default rate was pretty darn low but then for some of the entities they said no no we're going to treat these entities as though they issued junk bonds and their their likelihood of paying is the same as though is the same as on junk bonds well junk bonds are called junk bonds for a reason because they're junk and because they might not get paid and they have a very high return on those bonds for the risk but the, there's a pretty good chance that they're not going to pay up so you know dealing with many of their you know many of their clients as though they had issued them a junk bond rather than you know a, a, a promise to pay in 30 days or less um first of all junk bonds tend to tend to be a little longer than the 30 day which was what their real sort of risk was this was you know they some of them might have had longer to pay but most of them actually paid within 30 days so um it, it, that seemed a little strange um you know they spread certain volatile you know like first of all on their 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 rate of default etc cetera, etc cetera. they set it like like a in stone at the beginning of the period even though they were only using numbers for three or four years back which didn't show the full canadian business cycle so you know eat, why would you do that why would you set it in stone at the front when this is actually something that's likely to volatile likely to move um you know also you know just very basic thing uh things like that um <clears throat> and and one of the um can you jump in here jonathan yeah, for, a, for a couple minutes yeah uh, one of the one of the the things that uh, the the justice uh, boyle he talked a lot about or it's been, it was kind of surprised me as as a, as a trench price economist talk more about the selection of methods and and there's a couple uh quotes in there in in, in the document saying well it's on the oec guidelines and it's really more for the perspective of of you know the, the tax uh, authorities, uh, not necessarily the, the legislators, or, or more for the you know going through the, the courts and kind of having to deal with it differently, which I find a bit surprising because when they went through the methodology and, and how they selected it, uh, it 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 you, you kind of go through that same process of you know what are the different methodologies that that the OECD guidelines have that you could test this this transaction with, and what they found was that this transaction it's it's there's not a lot of good comparables out there just because of the nature of this of factoring uh, depending on the industry depending on the circumstances it can be quite different uh, the IRS they actually have guidelines for their auditors on how to audit this transaction factoring transaction it lists the information that that they they request and how the this transaction is, is typically structured where the factor would get a commission, there'd be a financing, uh, talk more about the recourse, non-recourse, and, and everything is quite different. Uh, so that's why when you look at the service transaction where they Canada received um, I think about 900000 per month for providing that the administration and the service of it, they had a lot more uh, information on what arms and parties do in that situation, and that was less um, that was that was more clear on what that price should be, and there's there's less conflict, and and that was not reassessed. But this this discount, where there's uh, you know the terms between McKesson Canada and MIH, where where you don't see that in the marketplace, where they you know it's kind of a, a non-recourse kind of recourse, where they if 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 the company if one of the receivables went bad, uh, MIH could get 75 percent of it. Uh, and they went through and, and selected of it, and, and a few things that, when you're when you're going to going through the methodologies and you're trying to find uh, market or arms length data, what they ended up doing is is taking that, really looking at what is what is everybody bringing to the table, as far as as risks functions, uh, what are they performing, what is the financing benefit that Canada receives, what do they need the money for, what do they use it for. And they kind of break down that discount into different factors. Uh, one of it is, you know, starts off with kind of addition of three different factors. Uh, they have it: the yield rate, the loss discount, and the discount spread, which they define each of these three factors, and that's how they built up to this 2.2%. Uh, and a lot of the other expert witnesses 
kind of come up with other different approaches or sometimes a similar or using other comparables which, which Patrick Boyle uh, rejected. Uh, just that, that whole process is kind of interesting to see how the court deals with the data and one thing that was is kind of a, kind of a common theme throughout and, and we'll touch us on this a bit later on, on, this, on the slides is that this whole transaction is, is really was for a, a, a tax purpose when they sold the receivables, McKesson Canada wasn't really in need of this lump sum cash and they ended up loaning out to another related party. Uh, so that, that whole theme that they kind of knew that this transaction was entered into, yes, you're lowering the risk of Canada, but it's really done for, for tax purposes. That seemed to have um, tainted the whole process and you, and you can see some of that with the, the wording on on, on the judge when he talks about uh, different expert witness reports where it's, he seems to have um, a lot of strong wording where a lot of the expert witness reports more advocacy and sort of uh, trying to get to, to this, this number. Uh, so it, it's kind of that whole background in, in that process where you're trying to find this rate that, that you're, you're stuck with and it, you know, these are some of the issues that, that you're dealing with. Um, Jonathan, I don't know if you wanted to uh, yeah, yeah. add well, a couple points to there. Yeah, I'm kind yeah, of jumping well, around a bit on the on yeah, these slides. No, no worries. We'll we'll get to that stuff as well because it's all and it's all good. But we'll we'll get to that. Like <clears throat> I was just going to say that like there were some things in there, as you said, with you know these various components. Where you, my biggest problem is I went through it and the judge kept on saying, and they didn't explain how they how they came to that conclusion or why they came to that conclusion. It just seemed consistently. For example, they assumed that MIH would borrow the money in order to perform this function at junk bond rates okay again the, with this junk bond thing it's like um you know i've used junk bond rates but only in highly you know uh, risky situations in doing you know sort of looking at transfer pricing and setting up prices but um but you know junk bonds for a company that's guaranteed by this huge company that has cash galore like uh you know that's ge like it, it sort of flies in the face of ge like it seemed like they didn't bother to sort of go through some, you know, if they'd had economists who knew what the previous sort of litig, uh, what some of the stuff was in the, in the woods, uh, you know, that was out there, they wouldn't have made these, what I think are, are some pretty, you know, pretty transparent mistakes. And the, and the biggest mistake isn't necessarily what they did, but the fact that they couldn't explain why they did it other than the fact that that worked really well from the, from the taxpayer's perspective. Um, you know, and there were, as I said, just to follow up on this, very arbitrary decisions. Like, for example, when they, they calculated things like, you know, the, the loss rate, they used a four-month moving average. But then in other aspects of their calculations where it would seem that the same logic would apply, they didn't use a four-month moving average. They just kind of set it in stone. <clears throat> well, I, I, first of all, how do, you, how do you then justify your four-month moving average the first time and then not do it the second time? And that is... You know, any time, and even myself, whenever you've tried to do, you try and set something up and you're working with transfer pricing people on this, um, you know, the issue here is just plain consistency. Like, if you can come up with a good reason why a four-month moving average works, then maybe you should kind of stick with that and just work that through the entire thing. And then, you know, you can at least hang your hat and saying, well, we can't, you know, we know that we should use four month moving average for that, but for the sake of consistency, then that's why we're using it. And at least you have an argument as to why you used it, um, which they didn't seem to have. Like there was no, like I said, no justification, no explanation. We just picked that number. You know, in some places they said, well, the number that we come to, and I can't remember which one it was, was 0.5%. We're going to add that into the, di to the discount, but then we're going to add another 10th of a percent just as kind of extra, uh, extra margin. And it was like, Okay, where'd that come from? Well, well, it happens to benefit the taxpayers, so that's why we put it in. You know, so that, that, there seemed to be a lot of very pro-taxpayer decisions that couldn't be argued or suggested. So anyway, um, so just moving right along, I'm just going to move through this and 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 Dean, uh, you know, jump right in if you want at any time. So McKe and this is part of what McKesson, what they were, what Dean was talking about, is that McKesson took some positions that were probably pretty difficult to defend on appeal, and you know. You know, I, I'm what I'm going to say is, OK, if you do the transfer pricing, you probably shouldn't litigate the file. OK, transfer pricing guys like myself would love to do the planning and the litigating, but you should really do one or the other because part of your case might be that you're going to have to throw somebody under the bus. And if it's your own guys, it's going to be very difficult to do. So that would be one takeaway is don't litigate your own matters. You'd love to. It's very lucrative, but don't do it. Um, 
because the problem is they wound up just trying to defend themselves and defend what they did. And I don't think that was very, the best thing they could do. So they, McKesson, as, as Dean said, you know, commissioned several transfer pricing reports, got a lot of people to come in. And rather than try and bring those guys in to say, okay, so what, what maybe ought this to be, you know, like just sort of, you know, free, you know, look at this thing and, and see what you think it quote, ought to be and give us your number and give us a fair opinion. And, you know, sort of something that you could support and argue. The experts just fell all over themselves in a lot of ways to defend the taxpayer's position to the point where it was blatantly obvious, as Dean said, to the to the court, to the judge, that these guys were basically hired guns. They were staying bought. They were told to defend this position, to hold the line no matter what. And, you know, in some of them, they just blanket accepted provisions. And, you know, one can see why the tax lawyer might accept a provision, but with, for an expert witness, you'd expect some type of explanation. The experts just said, uh, that's what we assumed. Okay. Okay. Why? Uh, 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 that's not the kind like, of like, like, we, like we all know the um, like we all know the story of of, of Goldilocks and the, and the three bears. Right. And and this is this is kind of a, a parallel to Goldilocks and the three right. bears because you have Goldilocks, you know, is, is is the is Patrick, you know, the Justice Boyle, and 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 he's kind of going through listening to these the five expert witness, the material witnesses, and everything. He's either it's, it's too hot, too cold, or not comfortable enough, and he never does find little bear's porridge or his, his chair or, 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 the, or the bed and, and he kind of goes through each of the different experts and says okay I, I can pick up that point I agree with you here but I disagree here and he never sides with one of the experts he kind of then goes through a process that was very similar to how TD uh, SI um, you, know, you, know, the, you know the Toronto Dominion there the, the securitization department how they approached it by looking at what is what is are the different components of the discount rate? How can we deal with them each individually? Which is similar to how the CRA reassessed it and, and challenging each of these three different three different areas, um, and 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 really put that together. So that was kind of an interesting look of it, and it almost it, it you, I get the sense of reading it that because it was. Um, very, you know, this transaction was entered for a tax purpose, uh, not for the business purpose. That there's there's kind of a higher standard that that the that the judge has, and and it kind of you, you read that a bit. I think there's one paragraph, 275, where he talks about the tax purpose, and he, he says that at the end of that paragraph, you know, if neither side has a business purpose or need to do a particular non arms snakes transaction, it will probably not be particularly persuasive to try to argue. That particular terms, conditions, provisions, or or approach reflect the particular business need of either party. Uh, and when we look at his comments on some of the the experts, um, some of them are, are, are very hard hitting to the uh, to the to the to the material. Like in the the TDSI, uh, you know, he pointed out a number of times that they've never done anything like that. Uh, the expert uh, there was. You know, she's an expert in, in the securitization, not necessarily the non-securitization environment. Uh, highlighted that the, you know it's, it's very soft opinion language, and he, he says it indicated that it's it's primarily advocacy. And, and when he talks about the PwC report, again, he, he doesn't really pull many punches when he's talking through it. That it's again primary advocacy. Uh, he talks about the one approach where they're kind of doing picking and choosing and, and ignoring data that that goes against what. They want for the for the position, uh, you know, Dr. DeFrish, uh, not too much there. He, you know, this this expert uh, did some work in the in the past with them, and it kind of uh, kind of stepped out, saying, "Well, you don't have the expertise to really go through the factoring um, engagement, but can talk about what methods, you know, the selection of methodology." Uh, another expert, um, Mr. Uh, Ryan Schneider, was. Uh, Particularly hard hit by the by the judge. Uh, here again, uh, you know, from your comments earlier, we started with the high yield bond index, which which uh, the judge found to be an, an inappropriate starting point. Uh, that expert witness made seven different adjustments that, from the starting amount, uh, ranged from 95 to 155 percent of the starting point. Uh, so it's Again, it's it's a weak comparable making seven adjustments, and, and the judge just jumped on it. Um, he kind of listed reasons A through I, I believe R on why 
uh, that approach wasn't wasn't significant, uh, or why that approach wasn't ap appropriate. Uh, and again, a very strong wording. So he's saying that um, overall, I, I can say that never have I seen so much time and effort by an appellant to put forward such an untenable position so strongly and seriously. This had all the appearances of alchemy in reverse. Uh, yet when the judge talks about the respondent experts, uh, you know, he does dismiss some of the approaches from from Brian Becker on the uh, the comparable transaction approach. He, he sides with his build-up approach, again, talking about the different components of the discount rate. Uh, a couple of other experts, they started with a, um, or they incorporated a reserve, which Patrick Boyle felt changed the structure of the transaction and rejected those approach flat out. But again, wasn't nearly the same strong wording as he was on the uh, appellant's witnesses uh, on, uh, on the approach. Yeah, I, 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 I love your little bear analogy that you want to be little bear. There's there's a form of arbitration called baseball arbitration where the judge or the, the arbitrator, you know, um, he has to pick the better of the two positions. And, and that's not what the judge did in this case, because nobody gave him the right answer. OK, everybody tried to give them the answer that supported their position. And um, no one tried to say, you know, I'm going to be little bear and I'm going to be the rational, reasonable, defensible one in the room. And maybe that might, might have wound up with a pretty significant grind off of um, off of where the taxpayer's original position was, but it probably would have been better than than where, where it turned out to be. And so I think that's that's probably this case. Now, as I said before, sometimes, you know, there are bigger picture non-Canadian reasons why, you know, a, a major multinational corporation might draw a line in the, line in the sand and, and give marching orders. You will defend this to the last man. You will buy whatever opinion you have to buy to defend this position because we're going to, we're going to fight this. And, um, you know, there is, uh, there is a, um, there are good reasons from a litigation perspective why you might do that simply because, as I said, you know, there are bigger picture issues and, you know, keeping this thing in the air for long enough that, you know, that it's not going to cause problems in other jurisdictions because of draw of deadlines um, it might be one of them. Uh, but the other issue is, of course, you know, very likely that this is going to be appealed to the Federal Court of Appeal. Um, as we saw with Glaxo, um, the Federal Court of Appeal can sometimes ignore the the tax court's finding of fact about people not being credible, or um, that's what you you know that's that's what you found in um, in Glaxo. So clearly, you know, federal court of appeal got sort of lost in the weeds, and so um, you know there there is an argument to be made for you know all out defense, um, and then hopefully you'll get in the federal court of appeal and you'll just lose them because they don't know enough about tax to to be able to make head or tails of this hundred page decision, um, you know. Uh, and, and that might be quite common, and you know, so I can see some of the some of the litigation reasons for it. But you know, it clearly, you know, Judge Boyle, as you said, was very much unamused, and, and it hurt their credibility across the board. It, it's, it's it's interesting, as you said, that they said, you know, this is a tax driven transaction, so you can't sort of argue that well, this is how the parties would do it in, a, in an arm's length transaction. If what you're saying is this is a tax driven transaction, you know. I, I see what you're talking about, about, you know, you have to, you can't then be arbitrary and then just rely on sort of, well, that's how we would do it. If it's a tax driven transaction, you have to be able to defend each and every component of what you did. Um, and if you can't, you should probably give up on it and try and find something that is credible. So in any event, um, moving right along. Um, so this is one of the things that was interesting about this case and sort of my position on some of the positive takeaways is, is at one point, the Justice Boyle does says, the Duke of Westminster is alive and well living in Canada, which is kind of a, 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 a the Duke of Westminster is a very old case, basically saying that you're allowed to arrange your affairs as you see fit, so as to minimize your Canadian tax, and and having there's nothing quote you know there's no tax morality against having a purely tax driven transaction, and, and um, you know and, and as Dean said he accepted that there was no tax purpose and you're allowed to do that, and. Uh, and and you know sort of taking away from this yes you can put in a factoring transaction where there's no real change or business reason to allocate risk or, or no change in the circumstances of the credit worthiness of its customers and, and no need for the funds so you can still so the the good news in this case is you can still do this okay it's it didn't stop it's not going to stop multinationals from being able to reduce canadian tax through structuring 
Okay, there's nothing that's not that's not what this case says. Um, and secondly, within the the transfer pricing legislation, there are two aspects. There's one way where they can say, well, the transaction was structured as though arm's length parties would have done it, and but you got the numbers wrong. We're just going to adjust the numbers. And then there's another further level where if they feel that there's really no bona fides whatsoever to this thing, and that the, the you know, arms like parties would have never agreed to this deal, period, then they can just totally restructure it and do whatever they want. In this case, even though this was purely a tax driven situation, um, Justice Boyle didn't feel that he needed to go that way and didn't do that. So, you know, that's further reinforcing this idea that you can, in fact, do factoring transactions, you can, in fact, structure your way to reduce your Canadian tax. And at the end of the day, if you actually looked at it, the 1.013% uh, reduction would basically wipe out half of their Canadian profits and, and have a massive reduction in their Canadian tax bill. So effectively, the taxpayer was, quote, better off with this transaction in place, even after the adjustments, than they were prior to that from a purely Canadian tax perspective and from a global tax minimization perspective. So they were better off. They were okay. The problem was they just went overboard, went too far, and then couldn't back it up, and then tried to fight this thing down to the ground rather than be a little bit more reasonable about it. You know, for example... Yeah, and, I, and I think, yeah, sorry, let me jump in here. Like, yeah, like yeah. one of the, just to be consistent, or, you know, to to, to, to add to that, overall there's, there's the general theme from, from the, uh, the from, from the case was that there's, there's a, a lack of arm's length forces, it appears, when he, when he talks about how it was structured. Because it, uh, you know, he made a point that nobody from Canada was, um, from from McKesson Canada specifically was was you know appeared or, or talked through uh, or the you know Canada's role in in, in establishing this or, or looking through or setting up the transfer pricing documentation it, it was it was not evident that that they've been involved at all uh, one part of the case they talk about missing 16 days and and this missing 16 days is when when they first bought all the accounts receivables. Uh, you know the days outstanding is, is about you know approximately 32 days. So 16 days is, is half of, of the days outstanding. So when a customer receives the product and the invoice, they then typically pay 32 days in, in the future. So when they when you sell it when they sold it to Luxembourg at the start, they've got a whole mix of that receivable. Some receivables they just sold that day. Some they sold 31 days ago and they're going to get money tomorrow. Some they got. 16 days old. So on, on average, they're going to get that money back in 16 days. Now, when they they priced it, they averaged it that 16 days with 32 days for all the other periods uh, for the five years. So they averaged it something to be like 31.7 um, when they factored how much money are they going to receive at the start. Uh, and it really essentially served to Luxembourg's advantage of cash up front or basically that or or you know that that profit up front that missing 16 days, and and the judge spent a, quite a bit of time saying, well, what arms length party would do that? Everybody knows it's it's an average of 16 days. Why would you average it so much longer, spread out over five years? It just doesn't doesn't make sense. It's not reasonable. Uh, and that was kind of all the way through. So I guess if if on a takeaway, what can we learn from this, or how can we avoid being in these situations if if you are entering into factoring? arrangements or if we have a business where you know this might make sense where we do have a large number of receivables uh, to different parties and, and this is a transaction that might make sense to enter in, in our, our structure uh, that it, yes you can still do it but make sure that there's a lot of arm's length forces being addressed that when you're breaking the discount out uh, you know some parts of it you will have uh, a market rates so other parts you have to talk about look at history within the company on on what is what has been the, the bad debts uh, and, and this hundred page judgment goes into a lot of detail on what are all the different aspects you have to cover it also gives you comparables for for servicing the, the accounts receivable that 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 can be used and I think the takeaway is that yes this can be used it's it's you know, I think of it as, as a, a transaction. Um, like, say, you look at the transaction of of, of a swapping your your fixed rate or your variable rate of interest on your debt to a fixed rate. It's it's something that that scenario is very clear, cut and dry. You can get market comparables to do that. You might be paying a higher fixed rate 
instead of a lower variable rate, uh, but that's a cost, you reduce your risk. Here, if you're factoring your accounts receivables, you, you know, it's, it's a legitimate transaction, you're lowering your risk, you're getting uh, some money up front, but you just have to make sure that you address all the arm's length forces and that it's, it's reasonable and that, that it, it's supportable. And a lot of what we've learned here, a lot of the cases the judges point out were, as you break down the different components, um, you, they, they tended to err on the, on the side of too high in the range going through as they're adding each of these different components. Um, and as a result, uh, it, it's much more difficult to defend a, a much higher rate, especially when it's about the same size as your operating profit, then, um, then again, you know, as you are saying earlier, Jonathan, you know, the 1.1%, the still there's a tax advantage and it still benefits the, the company, sure not as much if it's 2%, but there's still an advantage to doing that. You just can't be too, um, too outrageous in, in, in setting that discount rate. Yeah, well, there was one point where they, they said, um, you know, where there was a range and then they picked the top of the range and then they just added another couple of hundred basis points on it just for kicks, you know, um, a, a, as you said there, and they didn't explain any of, you know, generally methodology, you wouldn't be pick, picking, you know, the top of the range um, to begin with and you wouldn't just be adding on to it. So, so I, I think that that's a very good point is that, you know, you kind of have to go through um, the methodology properly and, and get some good advice on that. You know, um, about the only other thing that I wanted to, to say was that, you know, had they gotten some good advice on this, they would have gotten some more arms like comparables. But one of the issues that just sort of is a very technical point, maybe it's a little bit of Monday morning quarterbacking, but the key issue here is that the, um, the judge at the end of the day gave MIH no adjustment for financing. And if we go back to that diagram, which is way back and at the beginning, there was financing transactions that took place. Now, MIH probably shouldn't have been looking at a junk bond rate, but there were indemnities and loan guarantees and all kinds of stuff put in there. And what GE sort of tells you is that if you're part of a big corporate group and you have to pay one of the other corporate members, um, or you ought to be paying one of the other corporate members for, the, for these loan guarantees so that you can effectively bootstrap onto their credit rating and get money at a reduced rate that you otherwise might not be able to get in the market, that there's some sort of fee, but they didn't go that way. And, and, and I don't know about you, Dean, but, but this seemed to be something that to me, that had they sort of gotten advice in the beginning that they would have been able to do, and they might've been able to drive up, you know, the justification from sort of where they were to, you know, maybe get another couple hundred basis points out of this and move the ball more their way. But because they weren't, you know, because there was a no retreat, no surrender policy, um, they weren't able to sort of think around this and, and kind of defend themselves in, in any alternative matter other than, you know, hold the line at all costs. So I think that's, that's I think one of the bigger takeaways from this is, you know, yes, you might get orders from head office that you're going to have to fight this thing to the last man, but um, it, 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 it doesn't really help you. And, and I think that if you've gone through and made a bunch of sort of, uh, unsubstantiated assumptions, um, you know, what do you expect to happen? So, so that, that's kind of my main takeaway about this is, you know, you need to get some good advice in the beginning, uh, get transfer pricing, get transfer pricing experts in, but then once you're in a dispute, you kind of have to start to, you know, you shouldn't have the same guys litigating as planned it. That's just a bad idea because they're not going to be able to break the mold and say, you know, cause sometimes I've, you kind of convince yourself that you're right and then you just get into this well i'm right and i'm just going to believe the people who substantiate what i believe to be right and by the way if it turns out that i'm wrong i'm going to look bad so i'm going to continue to believe that i'm right uh because i kind of have to do that and and you know it, it sort of puts you in this very difficult mm -hmm. position um so I, I would take big takeaways about this are that you know you can still do this you just have to defend it and, and up front by putting in proper transfer pricing advice, getting your comparables, and then be willing to sort of, um, you know, fight, pick your battles. And, and there didn't seem to be any battle picking going on here. And, and I think that's sort of the general memo. So uh, that, those are sort of the, my final comments on this. Uh, Dean, did you have anything anything else? Um, no, just uh, we didn't uh, address the, uh, the transfer pricing penalty footnote. Okay, go, um, go, yeah, go through that too. That's and, interesting. And, yeah, sorry about that. Yeah. Yeah, and, and that's just the um, again, I kind of referred to it earlier as a kind of an unfortunate footnote because it doesn't, it doesn't. This case is is not dealing with, with um, 
you know, what has made the requirements for contemporary documentation for the for the purposes of, of leveling that penalty or, or not. Uh, but again, as, as a footnote, not even a paragraph that the judge kind of uh, says some strong wording. You know, it appears to me that CRA may need to review its threshold criteria. Uh, you know, you wouldn't expect it. Uh, last minute, fresh, not fully informed, paid advocacy that was not made available to the Canadian taxpayer and not read by its parent could easily satisfy the contemporaneous documentation requirements. Uh, yeah. So again, that's you know extremely strong, strong wording. And and when you read that footnote, absent everything else that's going on, you, you know, I'd say, well, how did they get away with that? Um, obviously, there's more to it, uh, and that's why I say it's kind of unfortunate because it it does a very strong wording on on um, on on the, you know the, the shape of their documentation with respect to this 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 penalty threshold. So again, it's kind of interesting, very strongly worded. Um, you know, if you're this year reading this, especially on the penalty review committee, you're saying, well, hey, how, how did that slip through? Maybe we should have put a penalty on that. Uh, just just and, some some background for for some people might not already know this, but in transfer pricing, if you do not provide um, what's called contemporaneous documentation, there's the opportunity for the CRA to put a penalty in addition to the adjustment of a portion of the adjustment, regardless of whether it results in actual tax, basically because you didn't prepare, like you just you know you, your your position was wasn't set up properly. And so the language of, the, of this, as as Dean said, was pretty harsh and, and basically saying, why wasn't there a penalty on this? Because these guys seem pretty half-baked and what they did provide was, wasn't all that great in terms of what they ought to have had. Given the $460 million original amount of this thing, you would have thought that they would have had a little bit better documentation um, than, than this. And so I agree. It, it, um, you know, there's there's a lot going on. Um, you know, there there hasn't been any sort of really big cases on penalties. So this is kind of a, a, a watershed where it says basically, you have to get your act together, and this probably wasn't enough. You can probably expect that the next transfer pricing case that comes through, the CRA is just going to apply penalties across the board and see what happens. You know, um, I can't see them not being sort of goaded by this into. Uh, you know, that's what I see. I see they're going to be goaded into applying penalties. So the uh, the takeaway from that is um, you have to get your transfer pricing documentation organized at the time that you put the transaction into place and not after the fact in a half-baked way, um, which is good for guys like me and Dean because that's what we do and that's how we, that's how we roll it. You know that's how we roll is that's how we do it um is do it at the right time but if there's people out there with that are feeling a little exposed then um they're probably going to get hit with penalties um, because i can't see them not reacting to this uh, dean do you, is that a pretty fair statement from your perspective um it, it yeah it, you have to wait and see because it is definitely not very um uh you know, it's, it's definitely not favorable wording as, as far as the penalty review committees is concerned that, you know, here's something that they've missed and, and uh, you know, next time they might not be as, as lenient um, or, you know, again, much more stricter on, on things that are close. You know, there's some documentation provided um, and they say, oh, no, it's just not good enough for, for what we're expecting and, and, you know, start issuing more of, of the penalties uh, on a go-forward basis. Um, the, the other thing uh, it's not covered in the slides is that the McKesson case actually they had two two issues in the case. One is being what you know we spent a lot of time talking about the, the factoring discount, the, the reassessment based on that. The other part is the um, uh, is is the uh, withholding tax that resulted from the transfer pricing assessment. Uh, basically, it's saying well, it's, the the Canada Review Committee is saying that this this amount uh, of 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 the reassessment is is a, a benefit that's being received. Um, hasn't been paid as a dividend, so redeeming it as a div dividend payable to the Luxembourg parent, and they're charging withholding tax on that. Uh, the the uh, McKesson said, "Well, it's 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 after the five years from the Canada Luxembourg income tax uh, treaty. Uh, you can't do that because it's past the 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 time limit." Uh, and it was basically uh, the judge ruled that no, the time limit would not apply here uh, beyond the five years, and that they're they would have to pay the withholding tax, and it's it's a much smaller amount, it's less material amount, but it's kind of like your a final sting that uh, the taxpayer goes through when uh, you know under you know what is the final cost of, of these 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 assessments, and and then 
you know, coming through it. They didn't get the, the penalties, but then they got this withholding tax uh, ding at the end. Yeah. Well, the withholding tax, I didn't think we didn't really go into it. I didn't think they, they had much of a case on that one just because of the, the it, this wasn't the court, the, you know, the, the, the court giving them their second kick. They, I think this was a little bit of them trying to put, pull a Hail Mary. Um, there was another uh, just just, you know, before we close up, there was another Hail Mary play in there uh, that they tried. Uh, that was part of this whole, you know, hold the ground, give no ground, never surrender type of attitude. They pulled up a very old um, sort of civil litigation type maneuver where they tried to say, well, these experts, the Crown can't say, can't try and criticize anything that our experts say because they haven't received, quote, notice that they're going to be impeached. And therefore, the Crown just has to accept whatever we say because the our witnesses are quote unimpeached because anything that the crown said bad about them or or d- try to discredit them can't be admitted and and of course judge boyle just you know blew them under the water on that and didn't accept it uh and i think it, very much the same thing with the with the uh, position on the um on, on the withholding tax is that you know these were these were sort of uh kind of hail mary attempts to try and you know, get rid of the whole thing on technical grounds. And, you know, I think what you can also take away is that those types of plays don't really work very well in tax court. Um, tax court judges, you know, the judge, first of all, their position was was silly. And they said, they're coming in as an expert witness. You know, for a fact that they're going to be cross-examinable on this from the beginning. Why would you not consider that to be proper notice of any uh, that they might be impeached? And second of all, he went around and said, and by the way, you know, they weren't impeached. We're not impeaching them. We're just taught. We're not saying that they were untruthful or that they were bad people or immoral or anything. We're just saying that maybe they're wrong, which isn't an impeachment. So, you know, uh, once again, I think there was an awful lot of sort of um, brain work put into this, uh, but it was, you know, somewhat misdirected. Uh, and I hate to be critical like that, but, you know, that's just, that's just a further example of, you know, they spent a whole time, a lot of time and energy on the withholding tax issue. And yes, they maybe had to fight it, but I don't think they really had, had much of a case at all uh, on it. And it was much more of a Hail Mary play uh, than anything else. So, um, you know, so, so that's about that. Now I, I just actually popped open the questions and I realized that they were, people were having sound issues. Um, and I apologize. Uh, one person said they had a hard time hearing me. Uh, I don't know if I was too far away from the microphone or, or whatever. Uh, I apologize for that. I hope that got better. Um, there is one question, uh, <laughs> uh, and the question is, is the CRA accountable to anyone? Um, and I think this came out of our comments with regard to SOFMOC and the way that they, you know, what was going on with that. Um, and then, you know, the, the, the question is, is there any, you know, there's a very long statement with it. But, um, uh, you know, the, uh, the key issue here is that I think that in many ways, um, when we go back to Sothmock, I see time and time again that there is uh, very little, um, uh, I don't think the court's quite doing its job in respect of 231.6, and I've made that very clear. They're not reviewing it. They're not really holding the CRA to to any sort of standard whatsoever of reasonableness or, or appropriateness, and they're just letting them kind of, you know, have a free for all with two thirty one point six. But uh, you know, so but I think that if you know that, um, you know, uh, the combination of all these cases basically comes that if you're in a situation, sort of the takeaway as from the, as a group is that if you're in a situation where you've got non resident entities, yes, you can plan your way to reducing the Canadian tax. That's not a problem. But you'd better be a prepared to defend yourself and put in proper transfer pricing advice in front, and second of all, be prepared to disclose everything you've got, and and sort of you know, um, be prepared to 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 uh, be forthcoming and 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 upright, and then you know, and if your position seems to start to weaken over time, um, to to adjust and and to and to be able to sort of be a little bit more flexible in the way that you defend yourself and and think laterally and think around the corners and out, you know outside of your own sort of what we did is what we have to defend box and, and then you might be a little bit better off so that sounds you know that's a little generic but i i think um overall um the the transfer pricing situation in canada is you know 
we're getting serious about this. There wasn't a lot of case law. You know, we're just now sort of seeing this accumulation of cases where you're you're getting enough information that you can really only see um, that a lot of people out there were, were, were playing what I call audit roulette, was that they were just sort of throwing something together and hoping that they wouldn't get audited and that those days are long over. You're going to have to really actually play to win um, and, and start thinking about this from the perspective of, you know, one, you're going to get audited, two, they're going to come after you, and three, you're going to be up in front of the judge, and you're going to have to have something to defend yourself with. And and if you don't take that perspective from the beginning, then you're going to have trouble at the end. And and and, and the CRA, you know, are, um, you know, th there's this issue of accountability, but at the same time, you know, they've caught, caught at least in my opinion, all three of the taxpayers kind of red-handed in that, you know, they're, they're doing stuff and then they're not able to defend it. They're doing stuff and they're not able, not willing to provide the documentation they need to defend their position. So, you know, uh, you know, in some ways the CRA is doing their job and, and sometimes that can seem a little rough from the taxpayer's perspective, but, you know, if the taxpayers were better, uh, better organized and, 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 you know, put themselves in a better position to defend their, their tax positions, they wouldn't be facing, the troubles they got so that's sort of my big takeaway from this uh people are dropping off now i think we're headed towards the end of the hour and a half we're at, a, we're at 80 minutes uh dean do you have any more sort of final comments before we sign off no no i think that's that's good i want to thank everybody for uh for uh, attending and uh, listening to us today and uh you know again if there's any any follow-up or any additional questions that you have you know feel free to contact uh, either jonathan or myself yeah. Uh, also, if you want a copy of the slides, uh, generally speaking, I'll email them to you if you just send me a request uh, for them. A couple of people already sent that request, and we'll try and have this up on the uh, on one or both of the websites as a recording for people to review at their leisure should they be interested in doing so. So I think that's it for today. Uh, thank you very much, Dean. It was it was it was it was good working with you on this, and and hopefully we can uh, keep this uh, on a regular basis. Thank you very much. Very good. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye.